Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Aster Gilbert, and I am the genre queer programmer at Milwaukee Film. Um, we have a very special event for you tonight. Um, joining me shortly will be the co-directors of the film Cured. Uh, Cured is a really incredible documentary, which we will talk about in more detail, um, about the movement to remove homosexuality from the Diagnostic Statistical Manual um, list of mental illnesses, which took place in the 1970s. Uh, you can watch this film by going to milwaukeefilm.org uh, and go to our Sofa Cinema, where you can rent the film currently. Strongly encourage you to check it out. Um, also, I want to let you all know that the Milwaukee Film Festival is in May this year, which you probably already know, May 6th through the 20th, but passes for the festival are still on sale. So you, again, you want to go to our website, pick up some of those passes. Um, we have a really stellar genre queer lineup of films in the festival. I can't tell you what they are yet, still very hush-hush, but once you see them, you'll definitely want to have a pass. Also, just want to put it on your calendar, keep an eye out for our Pride programming coming this June. We have a really incredible slate of films and events and guests, so May, June, a lot of queer stuff going on. Don't want to miss it. Also, if you are tuning in live to this event right now, live with me here, you can ask us questions by putting them in the Facebook Live or YouTube chat. I think there's a little banner or something that will let you know about that. Um, so feel free to engage, interact with us, ask us your questions. And now I would like um, all of us to virtually clap together as we welcome our special guests who are gonna join me right now. Hello. Hello, Patrick. Hello, Bennett. Hi there. Good to be so, with you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. So for everyone out there in audience land, joining me now, Patrick Salmon and Bennett Singer, who are the co-directors of the film Cured, who are talking with us tonight about the film. Um, welcome. It's great to be with you, Aster. Absolutely. Pleasure. And thanks for selecting Cured for this series. It's exciting to be here. Of course, I am I really love this film, so I can't um, express that enough. If anyone in the audience hasn't checked it out, they're going to want to after this conversation. Really incredible stuff, but I'll save my gushing for later after we get some <laughs> questions um, and start chatting. So this first one I have for Patrick, but really um, both of you feel free to answer this. I would love to know what the catalyst for Cured was. Um, what drew you to this? Why did you want to tell this story? Well, it's been a, a long odyssey to get here and we're always excited to, to be presenting it to new audiences. And again, thanks to Milwaukee Film for featuring this. I also want to acknowledge um, the independent television service. ITVS is funded by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And we were able to receive funding through the ITVS open call process and we never would have finished the film without them. And I know we'll get into the distribution efforts later, but uh, that's how the film will eventually end up on PBS. So. I do want to start with that. And um, in terms of this film, I first uh, got the idea for this. A friend of mine here in Washington had written a film treatment about the life of Frank Kameny. He's one of the heroic activists featured in the, in the film, an important pioneer in the LGBTQ civil rights movement. And my friend's film treatment had a scene that mapped out the 1972 APA annual meeting, The Man in the Mask, Dr. Anonymous, John Fryer. Frank Kameny was on that panel, but there's this dramatic moment for those who've seen the film where John Fryer has to wear a mask in order to be his authentic self. The irony is incredible. The sort, but it was an amazing piece of political theater and it really was so critical to this moment. But I had been aware of this story about how the APA took homosexuality out of its manual of mental illnesses. But reading this story in the, in the treatment, it jumped out at me as a compelling documentary idea. I was in the process of wrapping up the main phase of distribution efforts on my first film, Codebreaker, which was a drama documentary about the gay British codebreaker and the father of computer scientist, Alan, uh, father of computer science, Alan Turing. And so it was a perfect time. I was looking for another idea and, and Bennett and I had actually met during the distribution efforts for Codebreaker. He was actually a consulting producer on the project and he and I became friends. So I sort of recruited him to join me in the effort. And, you know, as we took a look at this story more closely, it really quickly became apparent to us how central this story was. And the more we read about it and, and did more research about it, we became more excited to tell this story. And 
one of the things when we started is we wouldn't we weren't quite sure how many of the activists and people who participated in this were still going to be with us and so that was one of the highlights but we you know we knew a lot of the people were at an advanced age so we got started trying to interview as many people as possible so i think our first interview was the spring of 2015 so it took more than five years to to get this film done but and i think our excitement and and you know uh, for telling this story is is really only increased because we really see a how critical this moment in history was but also how it can help inspire us to bring about the change that's still necessary wonderful uh bennett do you want to add anything to that um patrick mentioned kind of how you met each other got to know each other but what drew you into the story and how did you get involved in this film i'd love to hear your side of things sure um i think it became it quickly became clear to me as patrick was saying that this was such a turning point in the broader movement for lgbtq equality in america or actually in the world you know because um the american psychiatric association does have such an influence and until 1973, just to be clear, every gay person, no matter how well adjusted and successful and normal, I use that term in quotes, but how high functioning, you know, we were automatically classified as being mentally ill. And that is quite a significant burden on a personal level and on a political level. Like how can mentally ill people hope to be granted civil rights or equality or dignity, you know? And so, it, the the consequences of that label were really really deep, and um, I think the more that sank in for me personally, the more I felt like you know this was such a turning point. And um, many of the storytellers, the crusaders, the activists were indeed and are indeed still alive, um, but well into their 80s and 90s. And it seemed like you know it was a, it's a matter of seizing the moment and trying to capture their testimony and really connect with them at it and hear about you know what drove them to pursue this fight at a time when there really wasn't a fully fledged movement for lesbian and gay rights you know there were these pockets of activism and these handful this handful of of determined um crusaders i think is the right word who, who really felt that they were not sick and that they deserved equality and that they deserved to be treated with dignity. And, and that, that sense of um, self-acceptance, I think is at the core of the story of our, of, you know, and I think as LGBTQ people, there's often that question, you know, am, am I, I know I'm different. Why am I different? Is there something wrong with me? Those voices and that doubt. And I think there's, there's such a sense of affirmation that comes from this history and this notion or this truth that um, the APA's diagnosis was based not on science, not on data, not on evidence, not on empirical reasoning, but actually on prejudice. And so that's at the heart of the story too. Um, but I do think the real center of it are these crusading activists who before the world really was ready for them. <laughs> we're out there saying, we are the experts on our lives, we're not sick, and we're gonna fight to the, you know, to, to make that point. And they actually won. <laughs> it has a happy ending. So I was that's yeah, I was really drawn to the, to that sort of dramatic story. Oh, thank you. And yeah, we at Genre Queer, we love a gay film with a happy ending, right? Can't get it. <laughs> yes. <a> especially historical <laughs> one. It's, uh, you know, keep them coming, filmmakers out there, please. Yes, <laughs> we agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, just kind of, um, Bennett, you had some threads in there that I wanna, I wanna pull out. Um, you kind of started down this path, and also, Patrick, this question's for both of you since you're co-directors, but um, since Bennett, you started mentioning um, the production and the style of filmmaking, um, you know, there's talking head interviews in this film. There's a lot of archival material. In fact, um, I, as a side note, this is one of the best archival documentaries I've, I've ever seen because it's so easy to get overwhelmed in the archive. There's just so much information and the, the, the fluid kind of unfurling of information, it's the pace is just 
chef's kiss. I can't praise it enough. <laughs> but I, I'd really love to hear more about the um, production process. How did you decide on interviews and archival stuff? Was that just obvious for a historical story? Um, and what was that process like? I mean, um, how long did it take? I mean, you mentioned 2015 being the first, but um, yeah, I'll stop there. I really want to hear about the this production aspect of the film. And either of you, please jump in. Well, I can um, I can start, and uh, yeah, that this that was sort of those were the questions that Patrick and I were sort of grappling with for five years. So I'm sure he has some thoughts as well. And one question was sort of like, what is this the right style for this film? And um, uh, you know, we've Patrick more than I has has worked on a a film with scripted scenes and dramatic elements and i've done some stuff with animation and you know there really are different storytelling styles even for a documentary but it seemed to us that in this case a, a simple and kind of classic style with interviews of the people who were there juxtaposed with footage and and visual material and audio material of the scenes that we were portraying would be the most effective way to tell the story. Um, we did a, we did actually do a number of interviews with historians and experts, and we ended up taking those out um, again because they sort of got in the way of the immediacy. So the only people who are allowed to talk in this film are people who were there. It's their eyewitness testimony, um, and I also do think our, our two archival producers who spent months and months scouring, you know the the world's archives, um, the logical places like ABC News and NBC News, but also historical societies and activist garages and basements, and, you know, um, all sorts of unlikely uh, destinations. They deserve a lot of credit, Murdu Chandra and Luann Jones, for digging up some un previously unearthed material that I don't think has been seen for 50 years. Uh, so that was really a big piece of the story. And um, I think also our editor, Steve Hefner, really um, helped us shape this and give it a dramatic arc. It's been very gratifying. A number of reviews have talked about the suspense. One, you know, one very wise critic talked about this as a spy thriller. <laughs> and um, I feel like if we achieve that sense of not making the victory inevitable, Yes, there is a happy ending, but we don't want people to know that there's a happy ending in the first arc, or the first act of the film. And so that sense of, of how this battle unfolded and how things really escalated and um, un, um, emerged in some very surprising ways um, and unexpected moments, all of that is, is critical to the storytelling and the fact that we do, in some cases, we have like one picture from a given event, like the 1973 panel and yet because we managed to find audio for most of the key moments it feels very alive to me and i hope it's you know i hope the viewers have that sense of being at a at a turning point in a lot of moments uh throughout the film yeah because as the way uh bennett has described it when you set out on paper to make a documentary about meetings and conferences it's sort of a hard <laughs> sell but we really were fortunate with all we uncovered. And and I think, you know, Bennett talked about Steve, but he did such a great job bringing it to life. And and another, in, in talking about some of the specific archival material we found, I think, first off, the American Psychiatric Association should be credited for opening their archives to us. You know, some organizations want to hide from their history. And so it's a real credit to the APA that they uh, let us in there to, to take a look. And they would be the first to say their archive wasn't particularly, you know, it needed some organization. So they weren't necessarily 100% certain what we'd find. So I think they deserve a lot of credit for that. And another piece of it was Ben and I, I think together, sometimes together, sometimes by ourselves visited, I think about a dozen different archival facilities in person. You know, we... <laughs> I think that young people need to understand not everything can be found online. You actually have to go places. <laughs> not everything <laughs> has been digitized. And so that really is where this story came to life for us. I mean, Bennett talked about the audio we discovered for that 1973 uh, annual meeting. I think Bennett found that in LA. I was up at Cornell University finding some of the photos that are part of the uh, National LGBTQ Task Force archives. 
And then the highlight really was the Historical Society of Pennsylvania, where John Fryer has two, uh, his, his, he passed away in 2003, Dr. Anonymous, but his estate donated 217 boxes of material uh, of various kinds, books and journals and tons of photographs and letters, all sorts of things. And one of those boxes was uh, called miscellaneous audio. And I'm going to hand the baton back to Bennett since he was sort of at the helm when, <laughs> when the next chapter unfolded. <laughs> right. Like, we were excited, to, you know, by the prospect of what might be lurking inside the miscellaneous <laughs> audio. It was like the shoe box and a, with cassette tape. Some of them were not even in, um, in cases. So they were kind of fragile. And um, I sat there for an afternoon with the cassette recorder terrified that the cassettes were going to start unraveling and I, I well luckily none of them did but um there was there were like 20 or more cassettes with foreign language tapes and bird calls and some um organ music which john fryer was really fond of but in that mix was was in fact the audio of his panel discussion, the one that Frank Kameny was on also in 1972 as Dr. Anonymous. Um, and it was just kind of this amazing discovery um, that that enabled us to include Fryer's own voice in the film. We had been talking about like, who's the best actor to try to, you know, personify this moment and, and narrate it. And no matter who, you know, we were able to recruit in that voiceover kind of narrator role. I don't think it would have ever, could have ever been as authentic or as emotional or as true as the real audio. And so having that was and is, I think a huge gift for, for the sake of history. That is fascinating, really. And I feel like there, there's so many things I wanna I wanna jump on there. Like, yes, about the archives. Um, I'm thinking back of my dissertation research and like how difficult it was to track stuff down. And then it's like, you can't take pictures of this or like you can look at it for five minutes and, you know, <laughs> to protect it, right? To protect right. it is really difficult. And don't and, forget uh, about wearing those gloves right. and you know, keeping everything pristine. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, it's it's anxiety inducing and overwhelming. So uh, incredible that you pull out such a, thr a thrilling narrative from just this sheer uh, mass of, of material, which is interesting because as you're both talking about, especially with LGBTQIA history, there's a lot of gaps and there's a lot of stuff that was destroyed or people are ashamed of it or whatever. So um, the fact that you were able to find this material is, is really, really um, incredible and that, and, and Bennett, you kind of started us on this path of this question I want to ask. I would love to hear, um, you know, the, the shoebox of audio tapes, incredible. And I also palpably feel that fear. Uh, I do VHS filmmaking stuff. And one time there, I had an archival tape, machine ate it as it played it. I was like, oh no, oh no. So that's real, real fear. Um, anyway, enough about me. I would really love to hear more about um, what kind of discoveries did you make um, in the process of doing this research and making this film that really stood out to you? I mean, the, this one about the, um, the audio narration is, is beautiful, but I would love to hear some more tidbits, if you have them, about what really kind of surprised you in the process. Well, I think one of the things we were focused on was really trying to find archival material of our main storytellers. And so as an example, we were thrilled to that our archival producers uncovered this 1974 60 Minutes episode, which broadcast in August of 1970, excuse me, 1973, right as the APA is in the midst of this civil war. And lo and behold, there on the 60 Minutes episode was Dr. Charles Silverstein and Ron Gold, two of our storytellers. So to have that clip, to be able to see them in this time period is, is really incredible. We found another one of Ron Gold in an argument with, with an, an anti-gay protester and they're sort of screaming at each other. And that really just brings our storytellers to life in such a, such a profound way. Behind uh, Bennett on his, on his screen there, that's Kay Lahusen, homosexual Americans, uh, unrecognized, unrecognized minority. And she was such a, a trailblazer, uh, Barbara Giddings and, and Kay Lahusen. One of the highlights was, was spending time with Kay at her retirement home in, in Pennsylvania. And she really deserves so much credit for capturing key moments of our history because she was an amateur photographer 
and she understood the historic importance of what was going on. She's the one who took photos of, of the man in the mask, Dr. Anonymous. The, the, that historical moment just wouldn't be what it is without her photos. And, and we, you know, that, that history, you could describe it, even if we'd someone had come along and found the audio, it just would not have done justice to those moments. Another thing to, to highlight in terms of the archival search, the David Susskind show, 1971, the first time on national TV, a group of out lesbians were there sharing their stories. And this mental illness label was a central part of the discussion. And David Susskind was considered a progressive talk show host for the time period. And yet he was very much in the mainstream on this issue, defending the mental illness classification for homosexuality. And you really see these, you know, this group, this fierce group of fierce women challenging him. And through that find of that archival material, we were uh, identified Reverend Magora Kennedy. And we hadn't heard of her before in reading about this story, but we saw that clip and we thought, boy, we need to see if, if, if she's still with us. And so we were thrilled on a website of Stonewall veterans. We found her contact info. And as, as, you know, as Bennett says, if, if, if her name was Stacy Smith, it would have been a, a bit of a harder search, but her unique name, Reverend Magora Kennedy really helped us connect us to her. And she's been such a light to this story and her activism, even over at, at, at a, over age 80, she's st still an activist fighting for racial justice and LGBTQ equality. So having that uh, archival material of our main storytellers, we see them in the middle of this fight and then to be able to have them reflect on their past actions, I think really brings the film to life. Absolutely, Patrick covered a lot of our archival discoveries. Um, I would just say, you know, we also wanted to kind of give a voice um, to the opposition or to the doctors, the psychiatrists who were advocating and, and proponents of this mental illness label and, and sort of not make them cartoonish, but help people understand what their, where they were coming from, what their um, position was, what their philosophy was, what kind of treatments they employed, what, what they were advocating. And, and so we did find, you know, quite a number of clips, particularly of, of Dr. Charles Socarides, who I would say was the foremost proponent of this view. And what became really interesting in the course of the research and the storytelling was that Dr. Socarides, who had died, but he was is survived by his son, uh, Richard, who um, agreed to be interviewed for the film and who himself is a gay man. And so um, there's that really fascinating family dynamic um, discussed and kind of explored in the film. and. You know, it's part of Dr. Socarides' theory about, you know, why people become gay relates to the failure of fathers and, you know, their um, absence and their distance um, and, you know, the smothering mother, you know. And so Richard actually reflected on his own childhood and his father and his father's sort of in unchanging view that homosexuality could in fact be cured, which which he, despite having a, a, a gay son, Dr. Socarides really stuck to that position. So I think that's quite a fascinating piece of the film and extrapolating from that, there, there's this whole theme in the film about parents and children. Mogora Kennedy, who Patrick mentioned, um, had to, you know, had to decide when she was 14 years old, if she was going to go to a mental institution um, or get married to a man after her mother discovered that she was interested in girls. And so she talks about that connection with her mother and that life-changing experience. And, and Charles Silverstein also in that 60 Minutes clip talks about coming out to his own mother on the very day that 60 Minutes was visiting him to interview him. So just the, like the, very visceral family, emotional uh, conversations and experiences are also at the heart of the story. It's sort of like putting a puzzle together as you th think about the voices and then the visual elements. And, you know, as I watch the film now, it's it's um, it's been heartening to, to have people's positive reaction, but we're so immersed in it, it's hard to get a distance. But, you know, there are little nuggets of, of archival material or sound and 
to remember every little thing that went into it. Just one example, like I, there as near the end of the film, we're talking about the vote that happened in the spring of 1974, the APA after the board had voted to remove homosexuality from the DSM, the psychoanalyst led by Charles Socarides pushed to have a vote. I mean, this it's so absurd. You have this scientific process that leads to this conclusion, and now we're going to have a vote on what science is. It's sort of like the time when they voted the um, astrophysicists to take Pluto off the list of planets, sort of. But anyway, but this moment, we talk about the vote and, and you know, the archivist at the APA, Dina Gorland, found the ballot. And, you know, for months, I kept checking in with her. We're looking for the ballot. Now, we could have had that bit of, you know, story, but to see the ballot and see what people were voting on, and you take it for granted when you see it. But throughout the entire film, sort of every little nugget of, of of stuff you're seeing like that, there's a story to to how it was found and then how it ended up on screen. And speaking of that, actually, the uh, announcement of the outcome of that election was April 8th, 1974. So here we are, April 6th, 2021. It's like this week, you know, back in 1974. So I, I think, um, yeah, that finding that ballot exactly in our stalking or at least persistence right. like <laughs> i mean i think people who are archivists yeah were receptive to our persistence because they are determined like you asked her you know i could tell you just you get how vital and how how much of a difference the archival evidence and the texture of it and the authenticity of it and the existence of it as you said there's so many gaps and so having that ballot or having Fryer's diary entry in his own handwriting, it just makes a difference when you're trying to capture the nuances and the complexity of, of, a, of a complicated story. That's great, fascinating stuff. And I think it, it really, um, Cured is really a testament to that labor that you put into it. Cause I think the, the, the level of detail in the archival documents really brings this to life in a way that I don't think reenactment or maybe even a, you know, a drama could do per se. And um, the human element is really palpable in the, in this film, which is um, just astounding considering that so many archival documentaries can end up being a little dry. It's like, well, this happened and this happened and this happened, but you really feel that, that human element and that, these things transpired and within living memory, which is um, I think really important and also a really good um, kind of uh, transition point I, I want to make between from talking about the filmmaking process and kind of talk about some of the topics and its impact and, and the importance of this. Cause I do think apart from this film being great, it's really important and um, really needs to be seen. Sorry, I'm going to keep selling the film because I. Well, <laughs> Astor, you promised you promised gushing at the start of the discussion, and we appreciate that you've followed through on that. Thank you. It's really yes. I love to gush about the film. So <laughs> Thank you. The best part of the job, really. <laughs> Telling the filmmakers, I loved what you did. Um, so I guess to to make that transition, sorry, I'm I'm pulling up my notes so I don't sure. ramble too much. As you can tell, I'm a bit of a, a chatty Kathy. Um, but the so the film documents the arguments that you and others uh, made against what um, the subject Frank Kameny called the quote shad, uh, shabby, shoddy, sleazy pseudoscience, right, um, that underpinned the mental illness classification for homosexuality. Um, but the film is also this dual like unraveling of the pseudoscience and the politics and the political component of the story. So I really would love to hear from both of you, um, in your view, the, the, the DSM, was that fight about science? Was it about politics? Both? Can you even separate the two? Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on that subject. Well, it's one of the interesting things. We asked everyone we interviewed for the film, whether it was the experts who were left on the cutting room floor or the participants. And it, everyone had strong opinions and it was sort of all over the map. Some, you know, Ron Gold was adamant, oh, it's all politics. It's all politics. Nothing ever just politics. And then we had others who were sort of very strongly of the view, oh, it was a completely, you know, a scientific process. And it's, you know, it is really probably in the middle because the reality is the science that 
the gay liberation activists made very convincingly to the APA probably wouldn't have been enough without the outside pressure. You needed the people storming APA conventions and you needed the societal changes that were happening at the time. Of course, you have Stonewall happen in 1969 and the new activists, the new gay liberation activists who joined the movement after that spark of rebellion and their sort of collective anger and energy that helped put this pressure on the APA. And so some would argue, you know, pro probably Charles Socarides would have argued, well, the APA was just responding to that political pressure. And, you know, others would say, well, no, they were making a case to the APA that it wasn't based on science. And it was, I guess my view is it was both of those things sort of in tandem pushing and, and pulling and, and creating pressure on the APA to move. Exactly. I feel like, you know, at the heart of what the activist pressure was intended to argue is that these were doctors and scientists who hadn't fully thought about the so-called science that was classifying millions of people as mentally ill. So I feel like the politics were really channeled and harnessed and the political protest was used to to make a scientific argument and that it was it was that that led the the membership of the APA to when they did take that vote you know to say well we don't actually agree at this point that there is a scientific basis for this diagnosis um and and so that that is a fascinating piece of the story because i think through this fight psychiatrists had a more general sort of reckoning about what does and doesn't constitute a diagnosis and what should the criteria be. And so there was that whole process going on um, as a result of this particular um, set of, of discussions. Yeah, and I think this discussion and, and the film and the kind of the urgency to see it is very interesting in the current political climate, because this is, you know, 1973, but in many ways, these same conversations are still happening regarding transgender identity, which we're seeing all over the country right now. Um, but also in my own research found that there's kind of this growing right-wing belief that um, there was just normal science until the 70s, and then feminism and gay people and postmodernism just kind of made up stuff as they went. And so, um, I'm wondering, I, I would love to hear about um, why you, why this film is relevant to now and also if you're seeing any, or if you came across any parallels as you were making this film and screening the film um, to kind of the current political moment, because it's not just a historical documentary of what happened, we're still kind of living in the unfurling of this narrative in many ways. So I would love to hear your, your thoughts on its continued relevance of, of this story and why people should see it. Yeah, I think there are a lot of a lot of different directions in terms of the relevance. I guess for me, the thing that resonates most is the um, inspiration that this story can provide in terms of laying a roadmap about how to create social change. And uh, if you look at you know the the major social change movements, there's always been this this push between insiders and outsiders, whether it was the civil rights movement or certainly the LGBT civil rights movement. And, and the women's rights movement, you always have this tension between the people who are wearing, you know, who are going into the into the meetings and they're they're within and working within an organization to create change, and those who are pissed off on the outside throwing rocks and demanding action. And we certainly saw that, you know, we saw that with the, you know, the the, the BLM protests last summer where there's this anger in the street, and now it's how do you how do you transform that anger and energy into changing laws and to make that happen, you need the sort of power brokers who know how to maneuver the levers of power. And that's exactly what happened here in the uh, APA fight. Someone like Dr. Hartman was so a, a key to knowing the bureaucracy within the APA and knowing what had to change in order for the board to actually make this vote. So it, it wasn't enough to come in and, and scream and yell at a psychiatrist at a meeting, which was important, but you really needed 
both of them. And in many ways, at least in this fight, they really didn't like each other. They certainly didn't coordinate with each other. There was no grand strategy between them, but you needed the energy from both of them. And I think that is so true today with the social change movements that, that are happening. And it really lays down a recipe for, for all the social change, that, that push, of in, uh, push and pull of the insiders and the outsiders. And there's a lot of disagreement between them. And I think we should embrace that disagreement in terms of different strategies working toward the same goal. I, I would add also, um, here's an example where looking at history really matters in terms of social issues or debates, you know, specifically this notion, as we showed in the film, you know, that doctors were trying to cure or convert or fix or repair gay people. Well, that didn't end in 1974. And in fact, conversion therapy efforts re remain a huge um, source of brutality, I would say, and harm against people based on their sexual orientation and gender identity. 20 states have banned that practice for minors, but 30 haven't, you know, and it's, it's it is this ongoing debate. But what's been interesting is um, a number of organizations that are pushing for bans um, in, in states that don't yet have them have seen the film and have specifically said, we feel like showing this historical documentary to the people who will be voting on this issue and to voters who will be in a position to elect representatives and to a new generation of activists showing this historical story to, to those people actually could make a difference. And so I think there's this direct connection between what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s and, and where we are now on the issue of conversion therapy with one major difference is that the APA in every other medical organization is now on record as saying that conversion therapy is destructive. And so 50 years ago, the APA was saying this is a sickness and we can cure it now, thanks to, you know, what is arguably this revolutionary change. Um, the APA is out there saying this is destructive and the APA is led by an openly gay psychiatrist. So as a metaphor for or more than a metaphor, a concrete example of the way in which to some real d degree and extent change has happened. Um, I, I think that that's quite a inspiring and, and noteworthy um, development, you know, that, that as an institution, there has been within the APA, this really fundamental change on this issue and on other issues. Wonderfully said, both of you. Um, before I ask my next question, which is a continuation of that, I just want to remind the people viewing at home, you can ask questions and we will ask them of our filmmaking guests. So I see you, Marky, in the comments. Hello. You can all ask questions. Okay. <laughs> back, back to the conversation on Cured. Um, I, I'd love to hear what has the response been to this film? Obviously, you know I love it, but what have audiences, to the extent that you can engage with them in the pandemic and weird virtual you know, distribution and stuff. Um, what kind of feedback have you been getting? What kind of responses have you been seeing to this film? It's been really heartening. We premiered uh, last, late last August at Outfest in, in Los Angeles. And we were fortunate to finish our main post-production last, late last February, early March. So we were able to remotely get the film ready for prime time over the, you know, last summer. And the rollout has been really encouraging, really nice reviews, a, a range of reviews, and very positive feedback from the people who've seen the film. We've been in several dozen virtual film festivals and have won a few awards. We were just uh, in a festival in London, BFI Flare, and I think there were more than 40 reviews and news stories and notes published about the film. And we were on five different BBC programs. Ben and I were sort of taking the UK by storm. And a lot of that was because the UK is debating conversion therapy. And so I think that it, there was a good news hook, but it was particularly heartening to see the story with an international uh, connection. I know we have an international distributor in London and Drive is the name of the company. And the team there is, is finding broadcast homes for it all around the world. I know uh, a broadcaster in Israel has picked it up and a, a bunch of others are starting to, to uh, sign up and be able to show the film in their, their uh, countries. We also 
are really fortunate to have a, a generous grant from the APA Foundation to help with outreach screenings around the country. We've set up dozens of them virtually with LGBTQ organizations and mental health groups and community groups and educators connecting virtually. And it's been really heartening to participate in, in really compelling discussions and talk about the rel relevance of the film today. And people get, you know, that the, they're connecting with this story. They see how it's relevant in, in the present. And one of the good things about the virtual landscape is we've been able to include some of the storytellers in that discussion, the participants in the film. So overall, it's been really heartening. And uh, we're continuing with all of this throughout the summer and building up to a to a PBS broadcast in October, which will be a national broadcast on independent lens. Bennett, I'm sure I left some m other points on the table. Sorry to wow. <laughs> take you all did, your you, steam. <laughs> you downplayed the fact that we won the audience favorite award at Frameline, the world's oldest and largest LGBTQ film festival and at Newfest in New York. So I, I think that's especially encouraging that, um, you know, audiences had a chance to vote and uh, and they- The people spoke. The people spoke. <laughs> and we also won one of the top awards in this um, competition that the Library of Congress um, sponsors specifically for historical documentaries. And we were the first LGBTQ film to, to be um, in that lineup. So that, I think that's great to think about or to be, you know, reminding the country and PBS and viewers that that you can make rigorous um, historical documentaries about this piece of American history, despite the gaps that you mentioned at the beginning, which I do agree are very real, but um, that shouldn't preclude people from trying to tell these stories. In fact, it's all the more reason that the stories are urgently important. And so um, I, I was going to say as well that as part of the outreach events, we've really been focusing and we'll be doing more to focus on bringing together people from different generations. So we have elders like Reverend Kennedy and Don Kilhefner, people in their 80s and 90s, talking with um, young people, teenagers and, and people in their 20s. And I think that is especially encouraging and inspiring to, to think about what are the shared connections and on issues like family and coming out and how we think of ourselves and then what has changed you know how was life different for gay people in the 50s and 60s when they had this cloud hanging over them of you know am i sick and you know what what should i think about this the view of the psychiatric establishment and you know how has that changed and what are the ongoing battles so it's been great to be able to bring people together and and have partners like PFLAG and SAGE and Born Perfect and really um, turn this into not just a film, but an opportunity for discussion and dialogue and, and action. That's wonderful. I love hearing all of the accolades that you got. So clearly I'm not the only one gushing. Congratulations <laughs> to you both for those well-deserved awards. Um, and also that's, I just, you know, want to thank you for doing that kind of work with the APA outreach. It's really important, especially connecting our elders and ancestors to, whoops, to the younger generations to kind of see what came before them and, and how to move forward. I think that's really incredible work. Um, and thank you both for doing that. Um, I guess as we wind down the conversation a little bit, you both kind of already answered what the distribution plans are or what's next for Cured which if you have anything else you want to add, please do. Um, but I'd really love to hear what is next for both of you. Are you still kind of totally in cured land? Are you working on next projects that you're able to or interested in talking about here? Another collaboration, perhaps? I would love to um, hear what's next so our audience can follow with bated breath your next moves. Well, Aster, that's sort of like visiting someone in the in the uh, maternity ward who's just had a baby and asking, when are you having another one? True, <laughs> true. Like, I understand. I'm, just, I'm just kidding. But we are, <laughs> thankfully, the sort of outreach resources we've been able to raise really gives us the resources to really build out this outreach campaign. So, we, uh, you know, we, of course, have a bunch of different film ideas in our file folders, I'm sure, full of ideas. Uh, but we 
are we have focused. to talk about the the scripted series. Oh yes, yes, Benny, you you go first on Don't that. Forget that. Not to jump in. Sorry <laughs> no, to interrupt, please. but in terms of Cured Land, Cured Land will be expanding beyond nonfiction because the documentary has been optioned as the basis for a scripted series that is being um, created by Stephen Canals, the guy who co-created Pose. And I just think it's so amazing that after what he's done with Pose, he's chosen this story as his next focus. And you know, to, to think about the way that these characters can be fleshed out and we could get inside their inner lives and their emotional universe, like John Fryer, for example, like what was he thinking when he put on that mask and why did he do it and who was he? We've kind of hinted at that in the documentary and yet you could do a, a whole other and maybe more complex or at least, you know, dramatic um, portrayal of, of that. So we're looking at like a six or eight part series for FX um, created and written by Stephen Canals and we're, Patrick and I are on board as, as producers. And are, I'm really excited about that potential to, to reach a whole new audience with this really Unforge unforgettable and, and pretty much unknown story. And that's what Stephen Canals has said in some of the panels we've done with him. You know, his his main motivation, as I understand it, is really to honor these pioneers, these trailblazing activists, and, and remind people in younger generations that we stand on the shoulders of these giants. And and so I, I, I'm really happy that that we connected with him and that the film will have and the story will have that um, outlet and that new um, telling. That is really exciting. Um, I, I I can't wait. Um, and I <laughs> want to use that uh, to continue to pitch the film, uh, which viewers can rent um, through Milwaukee Films website, because you want to get it on the ground floor. And when the awesome FX series comes, you can say, yeah, I saw the source material. <laughs> um, but congrats, both of you. That's really awesome. And um, I'm really so thrilled and fulfilled to see this story reaching so many people. Because you're right, it is, you know, this is something I learned in graduate school, but had no idea this took place before entering into an archive adjacent space where you can find this information. So that is really wonderful. Um, Patrick, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Otherwise, we can. No, we're just thrilled to be with you. And and uh, people can see on behind Bennett, our website and uh, social media handles at Cure Documentary and curedocumentary.com. So you can keep track of, uh, of where the film's going to be. And we're just excited to have this film reach as many people as possible. Awesome. Well, with that, I will wrap us up. Uh, Patrick Bennett, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me and um, to our Milwaukee audience. I really appreciate you taking the time um, and I really appreciate you making this film. So um, one last pitch to the audience out there in virtual land. Uh, you can rent this film through our social, uh, through our sofa cinema on the Milwaukee Film website. And even though it will be on PBS later, Renting it through Milwaukee Film really helps support what we do. It supports the genre queer program. It lets us bring more really important queer films to this audience and awesome filmmakers like Patrick and Bennett to come chat with us. So um, be sure to check that out. And I also wanted to give one note because I should have done this earlier on, but the topic of conversion therapy in the film I think is really superbly handled. I know a lot of the um, queer audience is rightly concerned when a film is like, this is about conversion therapy because it can be a bit intense and traumatic, but I really want to commend you both on the way that you've handled such a, you know, um, traumatic topic for many queer people. And I think it's really, really well situated and really beautifully told in that story. So just wanted to throw that out there for the audience and uh, thank, thank you again. You. Um, all right. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Um, we'll see you next time. Rent Cured and watch it. Thank you. <laughs> thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. <laughs>